uh, host, uh, my my friend, um, and an amazing, amazing uh, technologist, futurist, thinker, professor, um, just an amazing uh, person in this space, uh, Lance Wheeler. Uh, he is the director of the Columbia University uh, Digital Storytelling Lab, but he's also been in this sort of space of uh, transmedia storytelling for a very, very long time. Uh, back when transmedia storytelling was a word that everyone used. Um, and he's doing some very, very cool things now, um, which probably also uh, will have new terms uh, many, many years from now. Uh, but extremely excited to host Lance. I will let him sort of uh, introduce uh, his amazing ideas and practice. And then we're going to jump on at the end with a QA. and a um, As always, if you guys have questions, as, as things are going, drop it in the q and I will try to synthesize, repackage, or present your questions. And, uh, you know, really, really excited for uh, the talk today. Thanks so much, Lance. I'll let you take it from here. Thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, excited to be here. Uh, just let me uh, share my screen here real quick. Uh, okay. So, okay. All right, um, so I'm going to be talking today uh, about some of the experiments that I've been doing with generative storytelling. I'm going to kind of set set it up and kind of explain what I mean by that. Um, so from from my standpoint, I'll just start with like a little bit of kind of an introduction to uh, to begin. Um, so for myself, I'm I kind of define myself as a storyteller and a, an emerging media artist. Uh, and I work a lot like in film and theater games and code. Uh, and that that work uh, kind of goes across traditional uh, forms into forms that haven't, I don't think, been defined yet um, and everything in between. But at the heart, I'm really a storyteller. And I've been doing that for about 20 some odd years. Um, with, uh, with that, I, I tend to do a lot of large scale installations that leverage emerging uh, technology, uh, sometimes with artificial intelligence, augmented reality, um, virtual reality, the Internet of Things, uh, a lot of times kind of uh, writing our own code to do them. And um, I'm very interested in, you know, a lot of what you see here on on this slide is long form, meaning that it takes, uh, sometimes it takes years to make some of these projects. Uh, and then I'm also really interested in, in my creative practice and I do an everyday uh, art project, which I share often on Instagram. And then I also kind of occasionally mint some of the stuff on uh, as NFTs, but um, uh, I'm very interested in this idea. Uh, I started just wanting to generate and make as much work as I could and, and to learn as I was doing it and to challenge myself. And so the scope of my work goes from years to one piece of art every day. Um, but today I wanna to kind of talk about some of the work that I'm doing in my own practice and also doing with uh, the Digital Storytelling Lab. I, I'm a professor of professional practice at Columbia University where I'm jointly appointed in film and theater uh, within the School of the Arts. Uh, and 10 years ago, I started the Digital Storytelling Lab at Columbia University, where I, I continue to be the director of the lab and, and help shape its vision. And what we do at the lab is we explore new forms and functions of storytelling. So forms are emergent technologies, uh, and functions are the idea of story for learning and story for healing, mobilization, policy change, entertainment. And we do that through three core areas. We do it with programs that we run. We have a master's program that we do. We do executive education. Uh, we do a variety of different types of workshops and labs. Uh, then we have events that we run monthly. Uh, a lot of them are done in conjunction with our partners at Lincoln Center. And then we do a whole bunch of virtual events to year round. Uh, and then we do prototypes. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the prototypes today, but the prototypes are kind of, uh, they lean into this notion of speculative design and uh, kind of dis uh, discursive design practice. Um, this idea of kind of imagining potential futures and, and then also creating uh, artifacts that can lead to deeper levels of conversation uh, and uh, so forth and so on. So today um, I wanna talk about generative storytelling. And, and to me, I think that there's some really interesting things that are shifting in ter terms of the authorship and the ownership of stories, You know how people are, are able to push button publish, uh, you know, and have been able to do so for quite some time, but um, how quickly things are accelerating in, in terms of the way in which people feel like they can make 
right? Like, so we've seen the rise of maker culture over the last decade or more. Um, and then this notion of kind of co-creation and participatory design is something that is at the core of, of, of the work that both I do in my own practice and we also do at the lab. And then literally kind of the affordances and constraints, you know, the opportunities that are afforded by emergent technology. So I'm gonna kind of talk about this through the lens of two different projects. One that I'm doing in my own uh, professional practice, uh, creative practice, uh, that I am also collaborating with uh, in certain instances with the narrative medicine program at Columbia University. And then the second will be a prototype that we're doing at the lab. So um, I wanna start with like, I think this quote by Godard is really interesting, you know, cause I, I came out of working as a filmmaker primarily, that's where I started. Um, and I've made uh, feature films, shorts, all kinds of things. And I always love this quote, you know, cause cinema is nonlinear, especially when you're kind of cutting it. But um, this idea that a story should have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. I, I, I've always loved that quote because a lot of the work that I do is rooted in fragmentation. Um, but also I think it's really interesting now, the time that we find ourselves in, that the story doesn't necessarily have to have an end. It can be ongoing, it can be generative. And, and I wanna talk more about that. Uh, another element that has affected my practice is the fluxus kind of art movement of the 60s into the 70s, uh, which was very instructional. It was very participatory, it was very social. This idea that you would uh, provide um, in this case, the two examples here are things that people could interact with and out of the interaction art would come, would, would arise. And I just think that it's really interesting in, in borrowing some of those things from that movement and then moving them in and looking at generative work and looking at this idea of what does it take to, you know, uh, shift the notion of storytelling or, or how storytelling doesn't necessarily just have to be hierarchical in the sense that it has an art tour. Like, what is it like to have uh, stories that can maybe be crafted by more people? Um, and so uh, Fluxus was a big influence to uh, what we do in the program, but also to me creatively as well. So the, the first project that I want to kind of talk about is called Where There's Smoke. So this project is, is the most personal and vulnerable work I've ever tried to, to make. Um, and I've been working on this project for a long time. I want to say that, uh, I, you know, I think I can trace it back to about 17 years ago, I wanted to start working on it. But I was kind of because of the subject matter, I, I was hesitant to do so. And then uh, that kind of all accelerated and I'll explain why. So uh, where there's smoke is, is, is a personal story. You know, I grew up in a firefighting household. My dad was a volunteer firefighter and amateur fire scene photographer. I found thousands and thousands of fire photos that he had taken. This image here is one of his. Um, and, um, and for a long time, uh, we, when I was younger, we had two devastating fires in my youth, one where a van erupted in flames and another where our house burnt down. And I always wondered if my dad had anything to do with those, those blazes. And so when, uh, when, he, got, uh, when he got sick um, with stage four colon cancer, he kind of invited me to come in and, and interview him. And uh, I recorded about 15 hours worth of interviews, um, you know, and he shot uh, for over 20 years from like 1968 to 1988. He shot all kinds of things in various states of burning. And in fact, when he passed away, I found about 60,000 slides. So I recorded about 15 hours worth of materials as I was recording all these kind of skeletons kind of emerged from the closet. And the piece was really kind of, uh, the inciting incident had come from a moment where my dad was being diagnosed with stage four colon cancer and being told how much time he had. And at that point, uh, there was a total lack of empathy and care. And I found myself really uh, disturbed by that. And when I left, I uh, just thought there has to be some other way to have these kind of conversations about end of life. And so the piece kind of started with this ultimate thing that was around a mystery about, you know, did my dad, you know, uh, set these fires and it kind of emerged into this whole thing of like that it became more of a mystery of who he actually was and then it became a mystery in terms of like how to navigate end of life with somebody um and uh you know because my parents really uh were kind of in denial about all of that and so um my wife and i were left to kind of help try to manage that for them their their health process so 
uh, you know, this uh, amount of information, you know, in terms of all the photographs, the story, the emotional weight of it, everything was really incredibly compelling. And I, I started just thinking about like, what kind of form could I tell this story in? You know, I have all these really amazing photographs from my father that nobody's seen that capture these moments. You know, there's this deeper mystery to it, but ultimately there is more purpose to what this is. It's kind of about, yes, it has an element of my dad and I's story, but how can it be something that can open up so it can be a jumping off point or a springboard to other people's stories or reflections as well. And so I could have made it as a traditional documentary. I could have done it as a limited series, but I was more compelled to try to find a different type of form for it and to experiment in, in terms of what that might look like or, or how could I take all these different assets that I had and, and how could I make them compelling and, and allow somebody to step into kind of an immersive driven experience around them. So I'm gonna talk through some of the design and give you a sense of what the experience is. Um, I've run it uh, a multitude of times and I'm gonna walk you through the iterations of it. I'm a big uh, proponent of iterating work, uh, prototyping that work. Here you see, um, this is actually uh, my mom and my son. Um, the first time I staged this, it was done as a four person experience that lasted about 45 minutes. And it started with a moment in an onboarding space. Um, it's interesting to note that when I did this, my mom had stopped talking about my father entirely. And she was at a point where they were going to start to uh, prescribe some um, uh, medication to help with depression. And my mom didn't want to talk about him. And I was running an installation of this at the Tribeca Film Festival back in 2019. It was set in a 1400 square foot storefront and you would kind of make your way and you'd start in a, in a, in a room like this that was nondescript, you sit down in front of another person, you go through a visualization exercise, which, which I'll explain in a moment, but then you would find yourself moving through a burned out house, you know, using a flashlight and maneuvering through this burned out house and stepping through a burned out hole in a wall and entering. Um, but in this first beat, I was really kind of fascinated by an interaction between two people. And, and so when my mom, um, she called me maybe a day or two before it was going to end at Tribeca and said, hey, can I come to that thing that you're doing in New York? And, and I said, sure. And so she came up and she went through with my son and my wife and I went through together. It was incredibly cathartic. And um, on the other side, at the end, she just started pointing to all these photos by my dad and, and just started talking about him and, and continued to talk about him all the way up until her death at the end of last year. So um, it starts with two people going through a visualization exercise where they're asked to close their eyes and imagine uh, that they're in a place that they lived in the past or they currently live. And they're asked to kind of um, uh, find something. They, they come to realize that where they are is on fire and they're given a few moments to save something that they're emotionally connected to. The only rule is that it can't be digital. And so they do this through a visualization exercise, they close their eyes and then they open their eyes and they're asked to draw the object. And then um, they end up interviewing another person and they ask one single question five times in a row, why are you emotionally connected to this object? And so in this particular instance, this was an actual object that came out of one of the shows um, the person sitting with a stranger that they've only met for a few moments got into a very deep kind of exchange, basically talking about how the watch belongs to their mother, how it's broken, how their mother is suffering from schizophrenia, uh, how, the, how the participant has always wanted to fix the watch but hasn't been able to bring themselves to do so. And then in the last question has this revelation that they realize that they can't fix the watch because they can't fix their mother, right? That's incredibly profound considering it was two strangers just sitting across from each other. So a lot of these, uh, these objects then make their way into the installation and become part of it at the end uh, as people make their way through it. This is an example of the first iteration that was at Tribeca, as I was mentioning. In that particular instance, you go into a storefront, you sit down, do the visualization exercise, and then you find yourself moving through a burned out structure there, there are enchanted objects within that structure. We used uh, load bearing sensors to recognize the weight of each of those objects. Um, and when one would be picked up in the room, the light table that you see there would come to life and the 35 millimeter projector on the, on the table would come to life and it would start showing things on screen. 
And then uh, the participants in the room would mix and match those objects to unlock narrative fragments. Uh, and there were um, a, a multitude of nine, I think, at that point. And the show was generative every time. It was, it was all based, it was never the same twice, right? And I recorded all the different data and I could track the different types of shows that were happening. And so that was like the first installation that we ran. And in 2019, I was kind of, um, it was set to kind of go off and be commissioned. And then uh, everything kind of changed with COVID. And I found myself kind of thinking about a, a new way to do it. And I ended up uh, subverting productivity tools like Miro, uh, which is a design tool, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with for collaborative design, and Zoom, which we're in right now. And I want you to imagine that uh, I build out all these collages and these things that could people could interact with within Miro. This is actually the Miro board that you see here. And groups of people would be in a breakout room so they could hear each other, but they'd be moving through this like kind of landscape traversing this landscape, this infinite canvas, and they'd be moving through and I gave them editorial permission so they could move layers, uncover things. There were prompts for participation where they would share something uh, and reflect, you know, um, and this was a mixture of like kind of journal entries, uh, experimental films, uh, and a whole bunch of other um, photographs and, and so forth and so on. And so I ended up uh, starting to run that like every Sunday at you know, like one, one o'clock and I thought, okay, I'll do it like once and see, I ended up running it for months. You know, people just kept coming every Sunday and ended up running it for months and then took it to a bunch of different festivals. Uh, but it was really interesting. I, I learned so much in terms of taking something that was in a physical space, then, you know, iterating on it, bringing it into a virtual space. And so with the third iteration of the project, um, I am about to open uh, an installation at Art Yard, which is outside the New York. Uh, it's about an hour and 20 minutes outside the city. And it's only a few miles from where my dad was a firefighter. But in this particular one, you're going to move through like a 2,500 square foot installation. Um, and there's a bunch of things that I'm experimenting that are actually on chain in it. And, you know, so I'm doing some things with decentralized art within it. Um, and, um, and I've set up kind of a, a geofence throughout it. So um, folks move through the installation using a flashlight that has a, a microcontroller in it. And uh, as they move, I'm able to track a variety of different data points and their movement and interaction within the installation is actually creating more art around it. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So uh, it's taking place at Art Yard, which is a wonderful facility. It has like two 2,500 square foot galleries or upwards of 3,000 square feet and uh, a beautiful 170 seat theater that's, uh, you know, um, pitched for dance. And uh, within that, uh, I'm doing the, an exhibition that'll run for three months, uh, uh, June through October, and then also we'll, have, we'll end with a live performance. So um, the, the, the core of this, as I mentioned, you travel with a flashlight. So we've built out you know, our own, uh, you know, modified, um, you know, the flashlight to be able to have a microcontroller in it. It's all customized. We built it ourselves. Uh, it has uh, the ability to do five channels of audio and to mix in real time. So we're doing a full generative score. So similar to what I did at Tribeca, the, uh, it's never the same twice for anybody. So all the, the stories are randomized. The score itself decays over time. The score changes based upon proximity, but also based upon like density of participants or uh, based upon what stories they've heard, um, based upon where they've traveled within the installation itself. And then there's a number of conditionals, right? Like this idea, if this, then that. So if for instance, a group of people are all around one area and there's too much light, we can dim down all their flashlights and cue something else. So we have the ability to kind of dim or brighten or shut off the flashlights, trigger audio and video, trigger external lights and colors and so forth and so on. And we could even do smell if, if we wanted to uh, as well. So, um, so the, the element of like kind of gathering that data as somebody's moving through the space is pretty interesting because the whole aesthetic of the piece is that you're kind of, uh, you're blind, you know, kind of clouded by grief and you're kind of moving through and, and uh, as you're moving through it, there, there are places in the experience that allow you to um, reflect on your own life too, similar to the 
visualization exercise that I mentioned that we did at Tribeca that starts this particular experience. But then there are other participatory beats throughout. This is an example of an open source tool that we're building that allows us to place the anchors. Uh, we're, um, we're working with a geofence uh, that uh, allows us to do it in a, in, in a way that we can set infinite zones. So we're not doing it with just like traditional beacons. Uh, we're doing it in a way where we can really carve up areas like I could know different sections of that couch, right? I could know, um, you know, where somebody was at the table, some of the things that you would get with beacons, but, um, but more like an infinite number of zones that we can create that will trigger these various conditionals. So this is a non-docent experience. So like the moment you pick up the flashlight, it just starts to, the audio in it guides you through. So it's been really wild and challenging to try to create a seamless experience of somebody moving through using just a flashlight. So in the first room, they can visibly seem, but then they move into like a black box, kind of almost like theater setting where they're kind of moving amongst these different spaces, interacting with them. And the flashlight is doing a variety of things, as I've mentioned, triggering different audio, changing the scores, degrading or decaying over time, um, affecting the lighting, the color uh, of the environment. So uh, we've been prototyping for a while. I've been doing a, a residency at Art Yards. So we started back in the spring where we kind of went into the space and just started testing and testing and testing. Um, this is an early prototype where we would set up some tables as potential stations. And then people were at this point, were moving through with a, a web app that we built that we could test with that would allow uh, them to move and just trigger some of the audio. Uh, but we were looking for like flow and thinking about cognitive load because in the experience, they're moving through a bunch of different fragmented artifacts um, while they're actually hearing something, while at times they're actually participating um, and, and, and potentially leaving something within the installation as well, uh, their own reflections. So, uh, so we, for instance, the, an early test, uh, the flashlight, there's a huge like four by six, uh, four by eight feet light wall that has about 500 slides in it. When you walk up to it, it's all, you know, like slides need to be rear, you know, rear lit. So when you walk up to it, it's not on, but as you get closer, the flashlight kind of dims and then the light wall comes up. So like a lot of subtle conditional things are kind of happening within the space. Um, and then you can see the, the prototype of the flashlight there where somebody's kind of carrying it. Uh, this has more ambience than the room actually has at the time. It's relatively dark within the installation space as people are moving. So, um, so there's elements of, you know, these fragments of audio that people are hearing, uh, these uh, pieces of art that they're interacting with, these participatory beats where they're able to um, leave something of their own within the installation. Uh, and, uh, you know, like when we did in Tribeca, we had a whole room that was just all those emotional artifacts that people had collected, uh, that people had chosen to save from their burning structures and, and written on, and it created a whole room of those that were really quite beautiful and powerful. Um, but also in the, the piece is a, a series of art where I'm taking my dad's photographs and I'm a glitch-based artist and I'm kind of glitching a bunch of them. And then also in addition to that, I am doing some things with experimental loops within the space, uh, you know, because I do I make experimental uh, works. Um, and then some of these are durational, so they change over time. Uh, and then I'm taking a bunch of the data. We have a plotter, like an axi draw. Um, and we're taking like some of the location data, the stories played, time spent, density of desks, uh, guests. And I'm taking some large printouts of my dad's work and uh, we're creating new art that's based upon the interaction of participants in the installation itself. So the, uh, the, the work is generative in the sense that it keeps, not only are people able to participate and leave elements of story in it, but also the uh, exhibition itself is creating more art throughout the whole duration of, of the run. So um, the last part that I wanted to kind of just mention briefly is a prototype that we're running at the lab, uh, which is called Blockchain Fairy Tales. And Blockchain Fairy Tales is open to anybody that would like to participate. It's a generative cinema project, meaning that a group of people come into an environment and together they craft uh, elements of the film that will be playing on screen. 
And it uses generative AI to do this. It uses an open source tool that I'll show you in a moment that, that we've developed at the lab. But, uh, but basically um, we start, this is an example of a show that we read, uh, ran at the shed in New York. Um, it started kind of a, in a workshop format where groups were kind of building out uh, elements of the world. And then that kind of stepped into a live performance that we did that was kind of generative. So the background that you see there is kind of being remixed. The assets were all generated out of the workshop. Um, we also do this in real time in a theater, but uh, groups of people are able to create the assets that are on screen. And then uh, a group of people is able, this is an example of a simple stage manager that we've built that um, allows for collaboration. So you can layer over any site you want. It's kind of about, you know, kind of retaking the web. You can uh, lay uh, animated GIFs, uh, text, video, audio over any website. And you can, uh, through a socket connection, you can end up interacting with uh, a variety of other people in real time and you can remix the web together. So we use this tool as a way to take the assets that are being generated within the, 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 the theater or in this workshop component. And then uh, some of the participants actually become architects of the experience that plays. And then it kind of uh, is experimenting with this idea of like, what would it be like for those formerly known as the audience to actually start to become storytellers? And what would it be like to kind of collectively create a story? We'll be taking this out. We started at the shed. We'll be taking it out all throughout uh, the remainder of this year and into next year um, and just traveling with it. But um, these are some examples of some of the art that that's kind of come out of it, you know, that's made in, in real time. And I'm just going to play here. This is just a video to close with that is um, just an example of like some of the some of the animation. Uh, this is this was done over top of a Miro board. So the assets that you'll see are being dropped in kind of a Miro board and then remixed by I think we had about maybe six different people who were working on this at the same time and remixing it live. So, you know, we're experimenting with kind of uh, oral traditions of storytelling. So folks are telling stories. Uh, Blockchain fairy tales is really kind of about new myth making and seven generational stories. And the narrative conceit is that a generation in the future is in trouble and they reach out to us in order to try to help uh, save them. And so it's playing with like speculative design and uh, you know, it's a discursive uh, design artifact, as I mentioned, that leads to deeper kind of conversation around uh, uh, a variety of different topics. But um, these are just some experiments, you know, experimenting in this idea of bridging IRL into virtual spaces, experimenting with this notion of co-created stories and participatory spaces, uh, and this notion of kind of everything from web pervasive tech, like in blockchain fairy tales, which is very accessible to, you know, more specific creation of different types of hardware, sorry, different types of hardware, you know, where we're, we're getting really granular and doing some IOT, uh, you know, uh, physical development. So uh, hopefully that gives a little bit of range of some creative practice and some of the ideas that um, I have uh, related to um, uh, my, you know, uh, the generative storytelling aspect, uh, but that's that's basically what I am up to these days. So I will try to figure out how to um, get out of that. Um, I'm not sure if I stopped screen sharing, did I? You did, you did. Okay. All right, Lance, that was awesome. It's, a, it's, re it's really, really inspiring. I have like a million little post-it notes here, um, but I'd also prompt anybody um, who's been listening to throw their questions in the Q and A. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's really interesting to me um, is this idea of, you know, how art is sort of like consumed, like how it's collected and how, and also I, I have all these C's, collected, consumed, collected, how it becomes commerce and how it becomes communication. And I think it's really interesting too, because I, I think that a lot of people don't engage with art um, because they don't know how to communicate with it, you know, or they don't know how to use, and you know, you're making an art form that is very participatory, that like, that, um, where it's not just about an artifact uh, that someone needs to stick in their home as a signal to their identity, but it's something that they actually co-create with. So I, I love to sort of think about, you know, just question, how do you think about that? Well, I think, it, you know, what you're talking about there kind of definitely points back to some of the things that I mentioned with Fluxus, right? Which was like a movement that was really railing against abstract art at the time, was railing against the hierarchy of how art was being, who was able to participate within it. 
And I think that there's something interesting in, it's a real design challenge, right? Like, cause I, I, I'm in the throes of it right now, right? Like I took a break from what we're doing, which is very nice. It's nice to be able to talk to you all, but we're, we're, we're in the throes of like, not only do you have to figure out how you can best kind of tell the story, you're making all the art within it. You're also doing like product design and user testing. And you know this very well from Blue Cat. Yep. You do this all the time, right? Like, so it's all these things that you're kind of balancing and you're trying to figure out like how to make sure the aesthetic is constantly, like you're guided by the aesthetic. Like one of the ways that I kind of navigate some of this um, is through, you know, uh, MDA, which is, uh, you know, kind of a game design. It's a game theory for analyzing games and, and then designing them, you know, it's mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics, right? The idea of mechanics is the mechanics that we know in a game. Uh, the, the, um, the dynamics is kind of like behavior. And then the aesthetics is the feeling, right? And it's, you go one way as a designer and you go another way as a player, right? Like, and so that's a really interesting, I, I find that having some types of methodology can be really helpful because you st it starts to come at you from all different sides. You know, there's the balance of, this is a really personal, where there's smoke, extremely personal story. It's become more and more powerful the more that I let it go, right? The more that I realize it's not just about me telling this story about my dad and I, but the way in which people are coming in and, and it's a universal story and then they want to express where it's reflecting things for them, right? And then they're expressing those, those things in the actual installation and it's growing and growing. You know, blockchain fairy tales, one show gives to the next show, gives to the next show. So it's very much like within the oral tradition of how, you know, stories would, uh, would uh, be passed from one, one group to another and they'd be embellished and continually they would go, but there would be no attribution for them, right? You know, now with things like the blockchain, can you have attribution in a way that wasn't possible before? Can you have more than one particular author? What does that look like? How does that work? What are the challenges of those, those underlying technologies? And, but ultimately it comes down to uh, a form of expression. You know, can somebody relate to the story? Can somebody feel something from what you're doing? Can they connect to other people in a meaningful way? Otherwise the technology doesn't really matter. I mean, all of this is really interesting coming off of what Apple has, you know, announced earlier this, this week. And a lot of that was like, I can now see you, right? And you can see me, right? It's this idea of eyes. But I think that there's something about a beauty of when you make things enchanted in a way and the technology just totally takes a back seat so like at a certain point, like, oh, I know that's a flashlight. Oh, it's on. I know what to do with a flashlight. And I don't care if they know there's a microcontroller in it or not, right? Like to me, it's like, how can it be magical in some way? You know? Yeah, no, no, I love that. I mean, there are so many different threads. I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's really interesting, I mean, and I've sort of run into this with this idea of like blockchain and attribution is that in some ways what it does is it solves it. It's it solves for creating like it, it solves for making digital art like um, kind of compatible with capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where it's like it, where you can be like, oh well, this was created by an artist. It can, it's attributed so that it has value. So then you can then trade it and transact in it and and you know hang it in your home and 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 create this identity. Um, which like in some ways, like I'm totally for, because I, I really want artists to get paid, but in other ways, I'm like, also like, there's something very limiting about art that is really geared towards capitalism, as opposed to art that is really geared towards communication or transformation. And those are different, there's somewhat different things sometimes. So again, like I, this, I don't know if this is a question, but I, maybe just sort of a prompt of, you know, how do you, how you might think about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think in, in blockchain fairy tales, we're really pushing against the, the kind of perceived notion or the, the use case of what, you know, decentralized tech is, which has primarily been pushed as a definance thing, has been pushed as the commerce thing, the capitalistic side of it. And really kind of looking at that and saying, how can we leverage the affordance constraints of that? You know, there are a number of things that exist when I make an NFT, for instance, right? There's the act of actually minting it, listing it, uh, potentially relisting it, burning it. Can I do creative things off of that, right? Like, um, you know, where there's smoke has uh, generated NFTs that we're doing around it, where we're kind of exploring some of the data set that we have from the live shows. But I was drawn to this idea of like, what if I collected something and like a memory, it fades over time, right? Like this idea that, you know, I can change the, I can change what has been collected by somebody, right? Yeah. Like, so, um, you know, finding the aesthetics, I think kind of starts to, 
it's a, it's a form of expression, I guess. It's like, what, what are you trying to say with the work? What, what right. is the intention? Um, in both these, these projects, they, they have deeper, they, you know, like they're, they're trying to do something deeper, you know, like in total vulnerability here, because it feels like it's just you and I, Josh, with a, a <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Right? is, uh, you know, my, my, a lot of people don't talk about death, you know, no. they, they aren't prepared for it. And my parents weren't prepared for it at all. And, um, and we could never have those conversations all the way up until when they died, you know, and the, and, and they 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 could have died. You know, we worked really hard to try to help them navigate that, but it was a reality, right? They, they came from a different generation. They didn't express their emotions around things. And I ended up making the piece because I couldn't really talk to anybody about it. And I felt like there's something broken here, maybe by making art, I can, you know, I can express something and help myself and help my family. Um, but then, you know, as I started to do it, it, it started to have more power to it, right? Like I started working with the narrative medicine program and we started running these workshops around it. And you started to realize how healing it was to be in an environment where you started to realize maybe you weren't alone. And, and it didn't matter if you were losing somebody, you could have lost somebody or you could be in the process of losing. But during COVID, we all lost things, right? You know, like there was a sense of loss. So it was really interesting to, uh, you know, find an expression for that because I'm often challenged, you know, people will say, well, man, why don't you just make a film? It'd be so much easier, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. there's something, there's something about it that's always really exciting about the thrill of like, wow, we're in a moment where we could be uncovering a whole new form or there could yeah. be new forms, right? Yeah. And we'll look back and we'll say, oh, one of those, those things were so quaint. <laughs> They're like silent film, you know what I mean now? But, yeah. um, you know, the challenge is like, how, how do people, how do you help people kind of learn how to like interact with what it is and, and feel invited into what it is? When I sit down and watch a film, I know the relationship. When I watch a TV series, I know the relationship. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just supposed to consume what it is. Right. These right. things are like challenging you in all different ways, but they have such potential in terms of the, the level of immersion. Yeah, I, you know, and it's funny too, because like, you know, you're talking about like the MDA framework and, you know, the mecha the mechanics of different art forms. And and what I think is really interesting is like, you know, abstract art, you know, that the Fluxus, you know, uh, group was pushing against has mechanics, you yeah. know, like impressionism and, you know, uh, it, like the Renaissance painting, all those things have mechanics, yeah. you know, and but like, I, I think often those mechanics aren't questioned. Um, and you're like, oh, no, no, that's art. Um, but then you look at it and you're like, well, like, is that the, is that art? And then you look at, you know, is that the predominant art of our gener of our time? Because you look at gaming and gaming is massively participatory and is actually much, much bigger than the sort of a linear passive storytelling of Hollywood. So it's like, you know, like what, what is the, what is the art form of the future? Like what, it, like, where do you actually want to place your attention and bets? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, there at least in the way that I'm kind of approaching it is I feel like an anthropologist a lot of the time. Like I'm kind of going yeah. on the wild. And I'm like, I'm coming back and I'm like, you know, don't eat those berries. They'll make you really sick. You know what I mean? Like, and you're just, you're just experimenting and you're like, wow, there's so many things that you can experiment with. Cause in my own practice um, and, and in the lab, we try to be agnostic with technology, right? Like we try to, the technology comes towards the end. It's the human experience. that's the most important thing. Um, and then we start to weave the technology into it. So, so I think like when, when, you know, when I'm thinking about this type of work, uh, I'm really trying to uh, create a full level immersion, you know, like what we're yeah. doing with the generative audio in this is really wild. Uh, Peter English, who's the composer that I worked with, not only on this, where there's smoke various iterations, but also he worked with us on uh, Frankenstein AI, which we took to Sundance a number of years ago, um, is this idea of how audio can evolve over time, you know, score, like all of a sudden a score is generative and it recognizes how deeper you're going into an experience and it goes there with you, right? Like that. that's a wild concept, right? That, 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 that doesn't happen. Normally I craft a score, that's the score it's locked to it. So this potential of generative storytelling points to this idea of personalization in a way that hasn't been there before. You know, it leans into what's going on with generative AI. You see us experimenting yeah. with it not only in blockchain fairy tales, we did it in another prototype from the lab that was called uh, Project Immerse, which was about misinformation and deception. In that particular experience, you end up going through it. We spent a lot of time studying um, QAnon before January 6th. 
and uh, looked at uh, apathenia in particular, this idea of where you find meaning within patterns or you use those patterns to help, you know, uh, you know, build stories that help you understand the world, right? And, and in that particular instance, this is 2019, 2020, we were using early tools that didn't require coding to do deep fakes and, and different manipulation. And so you went through that experience, like somebody, the narrative conceit is somebody's done a data dump, you're not sure who they are or why they've given it to you, and you have to work with a group of people to make sense of it. But then you come to realize at the end that 90% of it is all synthetic. It's all been made by a machine. So like, if you look at this idea of personalization, you look at where we're going with generative tools, and then you look at the potential of provenance uh, in what could be done with the blockchain, there's an interesting thing in terms of what does that mean in a truthless system? Like, how does that work with some of these generative tools? And how can you use them as a storyteller to potentially help make better sense of the environment that you find yourself in? So, uh, so I think those forms are a moving target um, and, uh, and it's really quite wild because often I'll just be like, look, I, I can't, I don't have enough time to tell you what this is. I can give you an elevator pitch, but you just have to come and do it. Right. Yeah. Because then you'll see it. And in fact, when we went to do this with art yard, which is an analog institution, amazing facility that is very into participatory art and very into social impact. They had never done anything really like with technology at this scale. So the first thing I did was I built a prototype and I, I went in and I, I ran it for everybody there in the full organization. And I remember there was a bit of tension with my team because they're like, are you sure you want to put that in front of people? And so I started my colleague, Nick Fortuno, who's a game designer, has this great chant that he does when he comes in and does uh, a lecture on MDA within my class where he'll, he'll start and he'll say, uh, the students are prototyping things and he'll start and he'll, he'll lead them in a chant that says my first prototype is going to suck, right? And everybody <laughs> yeah. in the room says that, right? So I started that with the arts organization and my colleagues were like, oh God, what are we doing? You know, and, uh, and uh, but then it was amazing because then the stakeholders were a part of what the process was, right? They understood it and it was so valuable to, to allow them to experience it. Cause I could sit here and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. But when the audio washes over you, when you find yourself in it, you know, even people there were remembering things that they hadn't remembered in years. They mm -hmm. it stirred things in them. It was incredibly emotional. And then it's a matter of like, how do you give time to catch people on the other side of it? What are the resources that you provide in the sense of where there's smoke? So it's a really interesting design challenge, right? Because you're like, okay, you have like getting people in, onboarding them in, thinking about the ethical constraints and concerns around a work and then catching them on the other side of it. Uh, all those things. And then the idea of in physical space or virtual spaces, I don't know, it's like super exciting because there's not a, really a grammar for it. You know, no. it's not like the way traditional storytelling works. So I'm constantly fascinated by that, you know, because it's like so wild. It's like, and, and then the happy accidents that you just continually encounter when you're testing and breaking something, you're like, I would have never done it like that. You know, like in the early prototype, I had, uh, you know, like, Cross generational, and we had a web app that we built to help get a sense of the flow and the cognitive load. And we were like, okay, you can listen with the web app to these stories, just use your flashlight. And you were supposed to bring headphones. A number of older people did not bring headphones. And I remember this one gentleman is walking through, he's got his phone like this and his flashlight's on. And he's like, <laughs> he's like literally walking up to other people and like kind of blinding them. And, and it's like, it was amazing to see all that like early on because we were able to kind of help with the instructional design. We were able to kind of weave in the technology. We were able to start to think about how can we make it more seamless? How can we make it more seamless? Because the more seamless it is, the more magical it feels, you know? Um, so th those things are, are, are fascinating because they're, from my practice, uh, filmmaking is incredibly collaborative, but um, ultimately, uh, you know, it's really collaborative on set. It's still hierarchical, but then it kind of pushes itself into uh, almost like a waterfall development method, right? Like, okay, we're going to edit. Editing's nonlinear, but we can't do the score until the picture's locked. We can't do the color correction until the picture's locked, you know, and then, the, then when people are actually seeing it, often it's so late in the process. You know what I mean? Like, whereas this type of work is like, you're literally kind of designing it with and for the people who are actually helping to test it so it's like a 21st century writer's room and you have to be really 
kind of confident in the fact that like, it's okay to let go. You can't control everything. And it's interesting when you work with people, you'll often see that their muscle memory kind of takes over and they want to kind of control what, I, I see this all the time with my students. They want to control what's happening in an environment. And you're just like, it's going to be much more interesting if you don't, if you can't control it. It's going to be much more interesting if you just let it happen. And to be comfortable with the ambiguity of a creative process is something that um, I think anybody could greatly benefit from. I'm not saying that you don't have milestones. I'm not saying that you don't lock code. I'm not saying that you don't properly QA. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying building into time the proper amount of design, you know, and prototyping time so you can work through a lot of those things that would just make it easier. You, you know, at Blue Cadet, you got a whole lab set up, right? You're doing this all the time, right? Like, yeah. so, you know, but you'd be amazed, at least in the field that I come out of storytelling, so much of that is done in the writing of the drafts. But then once that draft is done, it's considered to be the, it is yeah. it. Now, granted, some people change it as they run into problems, but the audience is nowhere near that process. You know what I mean? And, 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 and my colleagues would argue, well, that'll create the most messy, unpleasing story ever. It's just a matter of like how you're telling it and what you're choosing to tell. And then also how you're modeling things for people, right? Like to allow them to understand the relationship um, of, of what you're setting up, you know, like how you would like them to interact or, or how you would leave room for them to be in or to able it, to have freedom within it. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. You know, I, again, so many, so many different threads, you know, I, I, um, I, I went briefly to art school. I was at the school museum of fine arts, Boston, and they had their kind of like central class was this thing called artist process. And there were like really almost these like games and like these games we would play together where we would like, you know, communicate around, you know, art tools. So like I, you know, I'd have like this conversation with another person in my class only using material, you mm -hmm. know, and then I would have a cut and then, you know, like drawing tape, we couldn't talk and, you know, and it was, and it was a form of communication that was like very, very different than we would ever have just like sort of talk, like chatting. And then, you know, one, you know, one conversation that I had was with a, you know, very, um, you know, and whatever it was like, some so a a young woman who 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 I was friends with, and then another one was with an older lady who had been retired and came back, and like the conversations were totally different, um, and the and the output, you know, kind of was beautiful and interesting, and there was like an encoded meaning in it, um, but was really pop like important was the whole process of doing it. You know, like the, you know, like you never take the artifact and be like, okay, we're gonna like sell that to the MoMA for a million dollars because it did, like didn't matter. It was like the process of doing it that was the art. And I think it's like that's you know that's where I always gets it's such a it's such an interesting thing, sort of like untethering the product and the process and like figuring out which which is more which is more important. And I think theater and gaming in some ways invites people better into the process. And the product thing is like you know like what do you, what do you have like a which uh, video, you know, like, you know, run through of it. Like it doesn't like, that's not as important as the, as the actual doing of the, the thing itself. You know, and I think that um, that to me, you know, and I'll often do this with the students, you know, cause when they come in, there's a bit of unlearning that happens at the start of the class, because some of the things that have greatly affected my own practice are related to, you know, this idea of discursive design, speculative design, experience design, right? Like design yeah as a filmmaker I don't touch any of those things right like that's not a normal uh you know that's not normally what you do in the process more and more people are starting to embrace some of those things that came out of like design thinking or humanistic uh, approach to design but as storytelling is merging more and more with hardware it becomes important to understand like okay how do I actually communicate what this is not only uh, as a form of expression but to the colleagues that I have so they understand where we're trying to go. Like, so establishing uh, a, a language in which we can collaborate, you know, because a lot of the work that the lab does and I do in my own practice is bespoke, right? You know, you're kind of, it's its own thing every time. So like, how can we figure out, like we have like five principles that we work with at the digital storytelling lab, which I, I, I've been, you know, have come out of the work that we've done. I've come out of years of working and they're as follows, right? Like uh, a thematic frame. You know, having a thematic frame uh, accelerates a sense of, you know, a shared grammar around what you're doing, right? Like when we did Sherlock Holmes in the Internet of Things, there was this element of where we um, uh, groups of people would end up creating crime scenes. Somebody would know if there was tape 
tape on the ground that it was a crime scene, they would immediately start communicating in world, right? There was no, they didn't, you know what I mean? Like it just became a shared language. The second is this idea of a trace. And this is really important in participatory work. Like how can somebody see some little piece of themselves? You know, when they come to where there's smoke, they could come back and they could go into the room and they could point and they could say, there's the object I chose to save. You know, so where where is somebody seeing their contribution? Then the other is this notion of like agency, agency for one versus many. A lot of the work that we do at the lab will start with like a moment of reflection between uh, you know one person and maybe pairing of other people and then into smaller groups and then back and forth and back and forth, never allowing one group to become dominantly connected, always rotating people through. Because otherwise you have certain dominant personalities that take over and maybe somebody's introverted and politics develop. So the more you're rotating people through, it can be really powerful. And then the last is like serendipity management. I would argue that a lot of digital works are over-designed. They don't yeah. leave blank space for people to just bump into each other and for unexpected things to happen because you're so concerned that somebody's gonna break what they are. So like we use those principles across all the work, like they're at the heart of where there's smoke, they're at the heart of blockchain fairy tales, they're at the heart of what the work is. I, I didn't used to necessarily think like that. I, in fact, I, I never, you know, I have a learning disability, I'm dyslexic, so I never went to, I, I took some classes at a community college, but I never, I never got a degree, you know, and, and I'm at an Ivy League school and I'm teaching at an Ivy League school, right? And I'm there helping to kind of bridge the school into the future, you know, kind of r and d what the future of education is. And I think a lot of that is like the, the idea of experience design, the idea of like, okay, in order for us to navigate this complex world that we live in, it's constantly changing. It's constantly in flux. And there's all these different things that are emerging. You need principles that help you to kind of navigate how you work with these tools. And, and a lot of times the tools become dominant and people, they're shiny objects and people get excited about what they do. And they, they just, you know, like a moth to a flame, they just go right into it. And, and having some principles that you can use, whatever you shape for yourself can be very valuable because you can use them as like, checks and balances when you go to evaluate a new technology you can be like oh that's interesting how is it affecting the trace of this how is it affecting agency is it is it breaking that serendipity management thing that i mentioned you know yeah no that's awesome I, uh, so i think we're we're we are almost at time so i i will not be able to like like maybe we'll find another time to talk we'll do an, we'll do one of these as a q and we could just go fully down the rabbit hole but i would say that you know one of the reasons that i'm doing this webinar series and one of the reasons i'm super excited about scgd is that like i think there's a lot of um there's a, there's a lot of things out there where where people think they understand how it works like they under, they like you know it's like a museum is a, like like we get to how a museum works and it's like oh you have cases and you have artwork and you have vitrines and it works and I think, you know, really looking at the affordances of these mediums and also thinking like, okay, what are the new affordances with these new technologies? And like, what are like these like much richer experiences that you can give people and being very mindful of that and, you know, really creating a vocabulary so that we can create better experiences. Like, I think that's, I mean, it's, I think that's super, super exciting. And, and I, and I know we also have been tracking all the AI and XR and like, you know, I, I think storytelling is going to be very different 20 years from now than it is today. And like, I, I but I think, these frameworks that you're talking about being, are going to still be incredibly relevant. So let's, uh, let's, you know, so I, I'll just sort of end it there and, and thank you very much, Lance. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, I'll try to, I don't know if I answered all the questions, but I'll, I'll send them to you. Maybe we can like do those offline or we can, uh, you know, pick it up in a future conversation. Oh, and can I share one thing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In the New York area, um, this is a, a link to Art Yard. Uh, and if you're interested and you think you might want to kind of come out to, uh, to check it out, let me just make sure I'm giving you the right link. Yeah, um, I'll send I'll send this out to everybody for sure. Okay, uh, you uh, it, you know it, it opens on uh, June 17th, um, and uh, so yeah, okay, great, I got the right thing. It's um, artyard.org. Um, so here, and you can find out more uh, there. Sorry, my cat lock got locked. I wasn't okay. I wasn't like shouting that it's an organization. <laughs> Even if it is. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks so much, Josh. It's always great. And if anybody wants to know more, you know, feel free to reach out. Josh knows how to get in touch with me. And then also you can find out more at the Digital Storytelling Lab 
uh, you know, and we we're always looking for collaborators. And this version of what I'm running it at uh, Art Yard is intended to be kind of an MVP for what will be a touring exhibition. So, um, you know, thank you, Josh. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Lance. Appreciate it.